Hey, hey, Housers. Welcome to another episode of On the Way Home. I'm your host, Michael Braithwaite, and I am from the wonderful organization in the northern part of the GTA called Blue Door. Uh, Blue Door's an organization that I'm so proud to be associated with because it supports many, many thousands of vulnerable people to find affordable and supportive housing of many different types. Uh, it helps people access health care, and we put them uh, through our, cons- our construction social enterprise program. We launch them into the trades where they make uh, a living wage right away, and they can afford housing, so it's preventative. But hey, guess what? It also uh, boosts our trades across Canada, who we need to build the affordable housing, the over 3 million homes that we need by 2030, so everyone wins. Uh, Blue Door is doing wonderful work. Check out the work we're doing at bluedoor.ca. We do this uh, podcast in partnership with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. Hey, their conference is coming up quick. There's still time to register and get involved. It is in Halifax this year where they have the brightest and the best from around the world across Canada. All sorts of great presentations to kind of bring us together uh, and, and, you know, share ideas and uh, push us forward as we try to end homelessness across this country. That is not the only thing that the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness does. They do training, they do advocacy, and much, much more. Check them out at caeh.ca uh, and see all the wonderful things they are doing to make a difference across this country and around the world. We have, talking about making a difference today, we have some great guests. Uh, often we have our friends from CMHC on the program because uh, they're talking about um they're talking about the different programs that they have um, and that they're launching with funding attached to make a difference around affordable housing. And today we have actually, we actually have uh, Nick and Charlie from uh, CMAC. So we have Nick Schroeder and Charlie Coyne, and they're talking about uh, how they're looking at the intersection of climate change and affordable housing. And uh, so Nick is the advisor and uh, he's an advisor in climate change policy, and he's been uh, with CMHC for a little while. And then Charlie, Charlie is the financial solutions senior manager, and he is in charge of the delivery of the newly launched Canadian Greener Affordable Housing Program. So we talk about that program. We talk about how it came to be. How does climate uh, interact with uh, the building sector? We talk about uh, why it, you know, what it means to what it what is a deep retrofit uh, and what difference will that make you know why we need to also not just you know concentrate on new building but also the existing stock and bringing that up to speed around energy efficiency and how not only will it help with canadians climate goals but it will make it truly affordable uh for canadians and it'll be breathing cleaner air Um, and spending less on energy. So everyone wins. We talked about the details of the program, how to apply, some good examples. Some I I gave an example that wasn't a fit, but it's a fit for a different program. Um, So check out this podcast. If you have existing units, you're a housing provider, it's for nonprofits, uh, check out the podcast. Take a listen because they're going to tell you how you can apply uh, to get forgivable loans and loans to do that work because sometimes it's very expensive, but to get it done and to really bring uh, all your housing units up to speed, you'll be a part of the solution in solving climate change. You'll be making things affordable uh, and you'll make it, be making a huge impact for your clients. Uh, I hope you enjoy this podcast as much as I did. You learn a lot. I learn a lot every week. Let's go to that now. Nick and Charlie, I am so happy to have you on the podcast today. Thanks so much for making the time. Great to be here. Great being here. Awesome. And, and can't wait to talk about the awesome work you are doing. Um, but before we get to that, we have to ask you the question we ask every guest that comes on the show, because it's a little different for everyone. It's a little personal. And that is, what does home mean to you? We'll start with Nick and then go to Charlie. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so home for me means like ground zero. It's kind of where my day begins and where hopefully it ends. Um, when I think of home, I think of a place that is safe, uh, that's comfortable, it's stable, where I can relax, you know, kick back with family and friends and ultimately kind of let my guard down and be myself. Um, I grew up in a small farming community in, in the Ottawa Valley, and I would never have thought imagine that I would call home a small box in downtown Toronto in the sky, but there we are. I live in downtown Toronto in a condo and here that's home for me. 
quite a change. Charlie, how about yourself? I mean, I mean, not not too different from what Nick just said, but I mean, home for me is is where you feel comfortable, you know, emotionally and physically. Um, you know, my roots are, are, are small town Cape Breton. Uh, always a lot of family around, and you know, home is something where, where you felt safe. Like I said, emotionally and physically. Um, I mean, we're we tied into Sega now, um, so I think we're tackling more the physical part. Uh, and oftentimes we think of physical, like whether it's safe, you know, safety, accessible, and so on. But you know, the indoor air quality, just you know, your, your home itself is important, and you should be able to feel comfortable in your own home, whether it's summer, whether it's winter, minus twenty, plus thirty. Um, and so for me, Sega is an important initiative because, you know, it does help make homes more comfortable, which I think is important. Absolutely. Uh, comfort and home. Uh, just like most people, you, you didn't mention the kind of the four walls of a roof. It's not the physical structure. Really, it is about the people uh, and, and what's around you. So thank you both for that. Uh, we always want to learn a little bit about uh, our guests on the show and how they got into this work. I know probably when you, you know, in career day in grade five, you probably got up and said, I want to go to CMHC uh, when I'm old enough to work. But just in case that's not your journey, maybe you could share a little bit of your journey into your current work now. Charlie, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Nick. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, so Michael, you weren't too far off there. You know, I didn't in grade five get up and say I wanted to work at CMHC. However, I've been here since 2001. Uh, so I've made a career here at CMHC. I've, I've bounced around to different departments, but um, interestingly enough, I got the I got the chance to join our assisted housing sector in 2009. So I've been here for 14 years, and I still consider SEGA part of our assisted our old assisted housing sector, what we used to call then. Uh, it's now part of housing programs. Um, so that's where I really found my passion. And actually, if I if I go back to even kind of before CMHC, I wanted to be a social worker. And uh, it turned out I wasn't smart enough to get into social work school, so um, I ended up in government. <laughs> and that's a bit of a that's a bit of a joke, but um, to me, I'm, I'm kind of I've kind of done a, a 180 back. You know, I started CMHE and I've come back to that to that kind of field where I was what I really wanted to go in, kind of graduating university. And so for me, um, you know, I found a home here in housing programs. I was here when we launched the national housing strategy in 2017. Um, and before SEGA, I was, I was with the co-investment fund for five years. And so it's a natural progression um, to, to kind of where I am today. And, and I'm learning more about the energy efficiency and climate aspects of, of housing for sure. And, and Nick's been you know, great to work with on that front. And so for me, I'm more on the affordable housing focus, but um, really glad to be part of the SEGA team. Awesome. And just before we go to Nick, just in case people don't know what SEGA is, can you, the acronym is for? For sure. So it's Canada Greener Affordable Housing Program. So SEGA. And it awesome. uh, wouldn't be a government program if it didn't have a, a long acronym. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much, Charlie. Nick, how about your journey? Sure. I, I started my journey. I went to uh, undergrad in civil environmental engineering in Kingston and started my professional career cleaning up the oil and gas sector in Alberta for a few years. Um, kind of came back to Ontario and did some more schooling and more in environmental engineering, focusing a lot on energy, where I was kind of brought into the private sector and consulting firms for four or five years. But that wasn't really my jam. It was, it wasn't uh, what kind of what, what, what made my heart skip. I actually probably skipped my heart too many times. So I, I, I moved actually over to the, to the public sector and I joined in Ontario, there's the Ontario Power Authority, or is now the independent electricity system operator. They run the electricity grid in Ontario. And they had some energy efficiency team uh, to help promote and help business owners, homeowners, and industrials save energy and electricity on their bills and money for ultimately on their utility bills. So I ended up moving the ranks there. I was there for over 12 years. I ended up running the, the, the team as the director of energy efficiency and ran some large programs across uh, Ontario, working with local utility companies. Uh, but then during, during COVID, I heard this company called CMHC. I never really paid much attention to it before. And I needed, I saw they were starting a new climate change team. And I was curious and I, and I spoke to a few people out there on the team and, and got brought on, I guess it's just over two years ago now. So I've been part of the climate change team and working on some climate policy initiatives for the government now. Very cool. Thanks both for sharing your journey. Now, 
Nick, you know, if people are listening, our listeners are like, okay, what the heck are we talking about climate change for? What does that have to do with housing? But people might be surprised that CMHC has a strong focus on climate change. Can you talk to us a little bit about how climate change and the building sector interact? For sure. Um, so I, I know there's been a lot of discussion you can hear on the news about the existential threats of climate change. Notably, that's, that's you know our single biggest health threat that's facing humanity. However, if we kind of look into buildings, specifically housing, come through, there are similar dire warnings that we need to pay attention to. It, climate change is transforming our economy and represents a growing threat to uh, the stability, the affordability, and resiliency of our housing system. And because we know that Canada's housing stock is risk of, of is at risk of severe weather and climate related impacts such as flooding and heat waves and wildfires. And not only is it threatening the health and safety of Canadians who live in these homes, these climate risks um, uh, may imperil housing affordability and our system stability overall. So for example, we know that floods and fires and extreme heat, heat waves and rising sea levels threaten to increase the cost limit the availability and ability to obtain property insurances, which can significantly impact property values over time. So then taking a look kind of broader at Canada's commitment for climate, you know, we've, Canada has legislated pursuant to the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Act is to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 40 to 50, 40 to 45 percent below our 2005 levels. This is with changes by 2030 and eventually get to net zero emissions by 2050. So where are we today? From an emissions perspective, buildings represent our third largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, roughly about 13% of emissions. And it's caused primarily by the fuel we use to heat our homes and heat our, our water in our buildings, which is from predominantly natural gas in the urban settings or oil and propane when you go to more rural areas. And sadly, these emissions from our buildings just keep rising. Um, we know that the, the emissions from building sector grew by over 20% since the 1990s, driven predominantly by growing building stock, more buildings due to population growth and more commercial development. So yes, there is a, a, like a clear intersection between climate and housing. And this is what keeps me and my team busy here at CMHC on figuring out how can we reduce that and how can we build more sustainable housing. Uh, so interesting. I mean, there's a huge push, as we know right now. Um, was it uh, how, how many homes? Are we like over three million new homes, uh, and that might be low that we need. So, if we're talking about new homes and the construction of new homes adding to the challenge of climate change, there's a, there's a big challenge ahead of us. Uh, can you talk about how CMHC uh, is working to ensure our housing stock can adapt to climate change and, and some of the steps that uh, are taken? Sure. So as part of you know, the climate team, we've developing a climate change strategy that includes relating to both mitigation, so climate mitigation on our emissions, but also on climate adaptation. And we're, we remain rooted in CMHC's broader aspiration is that by 2030, everyone in Canada has a home they can afford and that meets their needs. So our, our strategy begins with our climate change aspiration is that by 2050, all Canadian homes and communities will be climate compatible and resilient. So in order for us to achieve this aspiration, we need to make some fundamental changes on how our housing programs are designed and how we work on our housing finance systems. So as a Crown Corporation overseeing housing initiatives across Canada, we do have a very strong role for, to help the federal government address this issue. So we've put in place a strategy to help mitigate the impacts of, of uh, the effects of housing on climate and to make our housing much more resilient to the impacts of climate events going forward. This includes adding many climate requirements to our housing programs and products to encourage more com climate compatible construction and re retrofitting of our, of our homes and buildings. But Building more climate compatible and resilient homes is not going to be easy, nor will it be cheap. As you mentioned, we have a lot more homes that are coming on board, but we also have a lot of 
homes between four and a half, almost some, some say up to 11 million homes that need to be retrofitted to be net zero and climate resilient by 2050. And this price tag has been tagged anywhere between 200 to $400 billion. So not, not, not small potatoes here. So we are taking kind of steps across our housing programs, our activities, even our own operations to help build a more climate compatible future for all Canadians. One of these such initiatives is what Charlie was mentioning is SEGA, our Canada Green Affordable Housing Program, which Charlie's gonna probably chat about you more, but this program is a great resource specifically how to support affordable housing providers achieve more climate compatible and resilient homes going forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and we want to talk more about that program. Uh, like many, like, like many CMHC programs, there is an aim. There's a reason this came about. Shirley, can you tell us more about uh, the program? How did it come about? What are its main objectives? <laughs> Uh, so, so as I mentioned before, so the Canada Greener Affordable Housing Program, which we call SEGA, and that's what I'll refer to it kind of throughout the rest of our conversation here, but it's a government program and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's number, its primary objective is to help affordable housing providers complete deep energy retrofits on their existing multi-unit residential buildings. So SEGA is, is one part of the Canada Greener Homes initiatives, which is a suite of programs aimed at helping Canadians across the country lower their energy costs and make homes more comfortable and reduce GHG emissions. So some of the other programs under this suite of programs, some people may be more familiar with them because they target more homeowners and they're more, you, you might see more of them through, through either through lenders or, um, or other means. But so other programs include the Canada Greener Homes Grant Program. So that's an initiative uh, ran through NRCAN, so National Research Council of Canada. Um, I believe I got that acronym right. Um, Canada Greener Homes Loan Program, which is actually delivered through CMHC as well. And then we, there's an oil to heat programs, affordability program. So these are homeowner programs under that suite. SEGA, on the other hand, specifically is targeting the multi-residential sector and specifically affordable housing providers. So in other words, this is a program for any affordable community housing provider, whether it be provincial, territory, municipal government, indigenous governments and organizations, nonprofits, co-ops, it's it's essentially any affordable housing provider it's, except private sector. So private sector is not eligible. There's other financing available uh, through other means. So, so this is a program targeting nonprofit affordable housing providers. At the end of the day, SEGA is a financing program that provides a mix of forgivable loans and repayable loans to help providers complete deep energy retrofits on the building. So that's essentially what SEGA is. And so kind of why or, or how did we get here? Um, and Nick just talked a bit about this, but we all know that we need more housing supply. Like you said, the number three, three and a half million new homes is needed in Canada. And, and by and large, new homes are built more or less quite well when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, but Canada's aging infrastructure, in particular, the affordable social housing stock, is increasingly vulnerable to more frequent and intense weather and uh, extreme climate related impacts. So putting not just the health and safety of those living in these units at risk, but also the buildings themselves. And so this is a precious stock of housing that we have across the country that's been built up over time since the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, you know, some of it is in desperate need of repair. We want to make sure we don't lose this stock um going forward because it is it is the vast majority is used as, as our current affordable and community housing stock and so it's important that we that that we that we acknowledge that and and that's exactly what SEGA is here to do so as nick was mentioning you know some of the government's climate objectives in large part revolve around this existing stock um, and so SEGA is a program to help offset some of that risk of losing stock and by helping providers improve the quality of their buildings, adapt to climate change, extreme weather events, but even more importantly, improving overall comfort and, and quality of life for their for the tenants. Um, and so SEGA, and as and kind of getting to the how it aligns with Canada's kind of overall objectives, uh, the government of Canada. But so SEGA contributes to Canada's emission reduction plan, and the design was influenced uh, by and large by the forthcoming Canada Green Building Strategy which will help in meeting the net zero emissions as Nick's talked about by 2050. So uh, it's an important program. Um, it's specifically aimed at the nonprofit sector and specifically at the existing housing stock. Very cool. And I love what you're saying. I think too often we hear about new build, new build, new build, 
But for, and I've, the numbers have varied, but I've heard anywhere from every time we build a new build, we lose anywhere from seven to 15 to crumbling infrastructure or the private sector buying them up. They're no longer affordable. That's an affordable stock. So yes, important to retrofit, keep the existing stock because we'll never get ahead if we don't. But it does come down to definition sometimes, right? And I think yeah. you've heard before when, when we say affordable housing, people will say define affordable housing. Because that, you know, CMHC will say 80% of, uh, I think, mid-market. or But for this case, let's talk about, can you help me define what is deeply, uh, what is a, a deep energy retrofit under uh, this program? So, I mean, that's a great question. So, and I'm learning more about this every day as well. Um, and, it, and it's quite interesting. So, a deep energy retrofit, I mean, at its, at its heart, it's just a renovation. But it's much more than that. Um, you know, they're meant to be an extensive, holistic overhaul of an existing building, uh, the envelope, the systems, um, which will lead to significant improvements in the building's performance through reduced energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. So, so at its core, that's what a deep energy retrofit is. It's, it's there to, to go in and retrofit a building such that you're reducing the energy consumption and reducing the greenhouse gas emissions and the impact on the climate overall. So examples of kind of what we would typically see uh, in achieving such a deep energy retrofit would be through the building envelope. And so this is kind of the main skin of the building, for lack of better words, uh, that helps seep all the either, the, you know, the air in or the air out. And so whether it's through insulation or air sealing, um, and then I guess more, more obviously through the systems. So whether it be high efficiency heating, cooling and water systems. So those are the components of the building that are, that are typically touch during a deep energy retrofit. Um, it's a comprehensive approach to tackling, as I mentioned, the performance of the building overall. Uh, often we, we need to urgently repair um, piecemeal, and so we don't get the full benefit. So if, if a furnace breaks down, we go in and repair a furnace, but if we don't address the envelope issues, you know, all that clean energy is still leaking out through the walls. And so this is a comprehensive overhaul of, of, a, of a building's, you know, envelope and systems to achieve those deep levels. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is existing stock. And so with SEGA, and I'll touch on this maybe if we didn't, when I talk more about the program stuff, but uh, it, it's meant for older buildings. So depending on whether it's a high rise or low rise, uh, it needs to be at least 10 or 20 years old. And so we are looking at the older stock, which are, which are, is more obviously less efficient than some of the newer stock. Absolutely. Are there, do you know of examples or can you share some examples of uh, people that have done this, have done this well? So the, the deep energy retrofit market, if you will, it's, it's not a huge market. And so it's still, it's still in its, um, um, you know, early stages. And, and this is what SEGA, I mean, I'm, there, there are, there are definitely examples. And we had one in our co-investment program of a project uh, in Hamilton that, that underwent a complete kind of retrofit from the inside out and was able to achieve kind of the, the, the some of the outcomes that Siegel wants to to achieve with its program as well. Um, but it, it, it's one part of SEGA. It's creating that awareness. It's incentivizing. It's getting people out there thinking, oh, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe my building could achieve this level of, of outcome. And so that is part of SEGA. It, it's getting it's getting it out there to get people thinking more about deep retrofit beyond you know, whether, because uh, there's other programs out there that support energy efficiency upgrades, but it's not a deep energy retrofit. And so this is, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, feel free to jump in, but this is a fairly new um, kind of market that we're trying to tackle here. Yeah, exactly. I, I would say traditional utility programs are, are more shallow retrofits, we call mm -hmm. them, like lighting, maybe a little bit of insulation, maybe some HVAC improvements, but we're talking about deep energy retrofits. This is a whole holistic perspective to it. So well done, Charlie. Very, very cool. And listen, I mean, when we talk about affordable housing, um, quite often we're, we're thinking about rent. But if someone moves in and, and we'll tell this to tenants who they'll go in or, or to our clients, we'll go and look at a place and uh, they'll say, well, the rent's pretty decent, but it's got baseboard heating from like the 1970s. That's going to crush them. That house is no longer affordable. Right. So not only are, you know, there, are there huge climate benefits, but actually affordability. If you're doing a wrap around a house, you're doing the retrofits like you're talking about, it should be way more efficient and ultimately more affordable. Wouldn't you agree? No, absolutely. And that's like, that's, um, I mean, when we think about SEGA and we think about this level of retrofits, especially in the nonprofit sector, um, I mean, typically, if you were to undertake this level of retrofit, it's expensive. Uh, it's very expensive. And so to finance these costs, 
they, they have to be paid for somehow. And so whether it's through kind of the operator, through increasing rent, or whether it's through tenants and increases in the utility bills, someone pays for it. And so SEGA is meant to offset that and, and essentially be as cost neutral as we can uh, to, to limit or prevent, ideally, any type of rent increase or, or utility bills increase for the tenants or the operator. It's amazing. So, so let's look down the road a little bit. What does success look like? What, what will you say, like, this program has been successful if... So I, I think it's, I think it's threefold. Um, I mean, firstly for the housing provider. So we've, we, we've been out getting feedback from housing providers uh, for a long time. And, uh, and even just from our own experience, you know, we've heard that there's a need for energy efficiency uh, retrofits in our existing affordable housing stock. Um, but there's a lack of resources, there's competing needs and priorities, and, and these energy efficiency upgrades never really bubbled to the top in terms of priority. It seems like we're always putting out fires and addressing those urgent repairs, as I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, so this deep energy retrofit, as I mentioned before, it's, it's expensive. It's, uh, it's often seen as a barrier for many affordable housing, community housing providers. Um, and so, like I said, if they were if they were to finance this conventionally, it, it negatively impacts potentially their tenants or, or long term affordability in the long run. So or if, if they're even able to access it at all. So they might not be able to access conventional traditional financing the same way a private sector operator might be able to, depending on the situation. Um, and so that's what SEGA is there for. And so I think, you know, firstly, it's the housing provider has access to this this really cool financing program to to start to tackle some of these big renovation issues um, to help with the environment. Um, and then secondly, I think the tenants. So the tenants, you know, they're the ones who ultimately will benefit from the, the new clean building that, that comes out at the end. And, uh, you know, overall improvement in comfort, air quality, comfort, we talked about it at the beginning, both Nick and I talked about, you know, being able to be comfort in your home, comfortable in your own home. Um, and so that's what SEGA aims to do. So when you complete these retrofits, the air you're breathing is cleaner. Um, you're not going to see condensation on the windows every morning or potentially mold on the baseboards. And so for the tenants, they get that benefit of just more overall comfort, air quality, health, quality of life. Um, and I said, when in buildings where, where tenants are, are responsible for paying the, uh, the utility bills, then we're likely not going to see a large increase in those either. And if not, then they potentially go down. So, um, so I think secondly, the tenants. And then lastly, it's the climate. So success of this program is if we can achieve what we want to achieve with SEGA, which is really aggressive outcomes on the energy efficiency consumption side, reducing and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I think those are some of more of the obvious benefits of SEGA from a climate standpoint. Um, as I mentioned, and, and Nick just alluded to, we often see retrofits today, but they're more shallow. So they don't go this far and we don't get the out these types of outcomes. And if we really want to get to our 2030, 2050 aspirations on climate, this is what we need to start thinking about. Um, and even even looking back that we know, like I said before, the majority of our existing affordable housing stock um, is it, old and it's likely going to be still here in 2050. And so we also believe it's good, better public policy to kind of tackle this issue now rather than going have to go back multiple times and do just smaller retrofits one after the other. And so uh, this is a great opportunity. Um, I think for nonprofit housing providers, uh, there's a lot of funding available. And so um, to me, success is achieving, you know, first and foremost, the climate outcomes we, we, we want to achieve. And secondly, um, you know, for the tenants and the providers to actually have this opportunity to go and undertake this level of, of retrofit. Oh, it's amazing. It's a win, win, win all the way through. Let's talk about who is eligible for this. Uh, how does one qualify or the requirements? Can you share the funding details? Yeah. So the, so in terms of the program, so the eligibility, um, it's not that much different than other CMHC programs. So anyone out there listening who's familiar with other programs, a lot of the eligibility stuff is similar. Um, the key differences with SEGA, uh, as I mentioned on the top, it's for housing, it's for affordable housing providers and it's not for private sector. Um, those nonprofit providers could be in the form of provincial, territorial, municipal, indigenous, um, co-op. Uh, as long as your mandate and purpose is to provide affordable housing, you're eligible from an applicant standpoint. So you talked about definitions of affordability earlier, so we're not getting into any of that. We just really want to know that we're dealing with someone who provides affordable housing and they have a mandate to do so. And so we're, we're pretty we're, we're pretty generic on, on, on from that standpoint. Um, SEGA is a residential retrofit program. And so the building has to be primarily residential. 
we too allow we do allow for some whether it's ground floor commercial social enterprise space but by and large it's a residential building and so um and, and rather than institutional so we're not getting into any type of institutional buildings it it's really has to be a residential building um similar to other programs like we are dealing with this is not a homeowner program it's multi-unit so five plus units so we're not uh, you can have individual scattered units but the nonprofit or organization as a whole needs to have at least five units under their belt uh, in terms of being eligible. Um, but other than that, like I said, there are some criteria around depending whether it's low rise, high rise, the age of the building. And so all that information is available on my website. But uh, it's essentially if you have an older building that hasn't really undergone any major renovations recently, there's a good chance you might be eligible to achieve the outcomes through SEGA. Um, from a funding standpoint, we have a couple streams. So SEGA is actually composed of two different streams. One is called pre-retrofit. And so as one of the requirements to get into our SEGA program, you have to produce a number of technical reports. So we want to be able to see that your building can actually achieve these aggressive outcomes um, once renovations actually start. And so the pre-retrofit stream of funding actually provides some upfront contribution money, so it's not repayable loan, uh, to help get these reports. So these are energy modeling studies, energy audits, uh, building condition assessments, any type of cost estimates. So these are all the all the reports and documentation that you're going to need when you apply for the retrofit program to show us that the building can actually achieve what we want it to achieve. Um, on the pre-retrofit side, we have, it's not a lot of money, um, to be honest with you, and we had a lot of demand. So our program launched June 1st, and we had phenomenal demand. Uh, over 250 applications submitted. We unfortunately were not able to fund a lot of them, uh, but our window two opens on November 1st. And so funding available through pre-retrofit is up to 130,000 per application. So it's not on pre-unit basis uh, to help with these upfront costs. On the retrofit side, and you don't have to come through pre-retrofit. If, if you can get these reports on your own, there's no requirement to go through pre-retrofit at all. You can come directly to retrofit. The retrofit program has over 1.1 billion available. So the breakdown on that funding is approximately 500 million in forgivable loans and the remainder in repayable. Now, if you're approved for SEGA funding, the, your funding is gonna predominantly be forgivable. As I mentioned, we want this to be as cost neutral as we can. Uh, the idea being that the energy savings, energy energy savings you realize as a result of the renovations will help offset any loan payment. And so it's cost neutral at the end. Um, so, so that's what's available from a funding standpoint. Um, on the pre-retrofit side, as I mentioned, it's window based. Our next window is coming up November 1st. And on the retrofit side, it's currently continuous intake. So the application portal is open. If, if you have your application ready, you know, please don't hesitate. If you have questions, reach out to someone and talk to someone about the process. But uh, it's open for business now for applications. So, so let me throw something out there. We've, we've read a lot about, you know, part of the, um, part, part of new stock of housing or adding more to affordable is people are retrofitting churches, old post up, things like that. If you're buying a building to turn it into residential, qualify or no, is that the pre, is that? So there, there's, there's programs. So essentially what you're, what I think you're referring to is basically converting, like a non-resident. Yeah, yeah, like even office space, they're talking about converting to residential, which is very expensive sure. and not very energy efficient. Right? For sure, and it's so it, it's it's not for SEGA. There's other programs, so we have other programs that can that can help in the converting. To support the that, yeah. of, SEGA is very specific to improving performance of an existing building, and so right, when you right. take an office building and, and convert it to residential, what are you actually improving? Because it's currently not residential use. And so SEGA is specific to uh, the existing stock. And as we talked about earlier, there's no shortage of existing stock that you can oh, repair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there are other programs for you. If, and we have done programs on the full investment fund, converting churches to residential and so forth. For sure. It's interesting. We, uh, at Blue Door, a while back through Reaching Home, we were able to buy a fourplex that was quite <laughs> old. And it was, I mean, when we got in there to look at the systems and all, it was a mess. Right, so something like that would be perfect for, we've got four different units in there and you know, retrofitting that um, and, and a number of other units that we do have that are using. Uh, we, we've actually got a we work, we, we have a home, uh, part, it's a Parks Canada home um, that we uh, turned into a duplex, but it's, it's heated with uh, oil, I believe. 
So this might be a type of home that uh, we could uh, we could apply for something to, to change up. This is incredible. Uh, such an exciting program. If people, of course, listen to this podcast, there's a lot of info here. If they want more info, uh, they didn't have time to chop things down, where do they go? Your one-stop shopping is obviously cmhd.ca. And to be even more specific, cmhd.ca slash SEGA will bring you right to our landing page. Lots of information, lots of resources. Um, CMHD multi-using excuse me, multi-unit housing specialists are on the ground across the country. And so depending on where you live, and again, believe through the website, you can kind of track down who your rep is and they're more willing to, to, to talk to you about this as well. Uh, website is probably the first stop shop to get all the information you need to see if it's something that perhaps, you know, could work for your building. Yeah, I agree. Go to the website, check it out. If you have questions, talk with your specialist, maybe to see uh, what next steps are, if you should follow up with an application. Sure. And the dates for that, you're saying uh, one is ongoing, and then the pre opens November 2nd. The right? pre retrofit opens uh, it's November 1st of the weekend. Uh, it opens November 1st if it's a business day. <laughs> but, okay, for sure. But yeah, it opens up for intake November 1st. It'll be open for three months before we make approvals for next fiscal year. Uh, retrofit's open for business, so if your project is ready and you have your reports, we're, we're open for business. Very, very cool. Well, thanks, Nick and Charlie. Thank you so much for all you're doing for Canadians um, with this work. It's important, it's innovative, it's different, uh, and it's much needed. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. We'll see you next time on the way home. Thank you very much, Michael. Appreciate it.